Oh, great. Okay. <coughs> so the next talk is given by Srikant Sastri. Thank you. So um, let me start out again by uh, congratulating the organizers for keeping this uh, series of meetings going. It's great. It's, it's really uh, nice to see this community come together in this way every year. Um, now, uh, so the work I'm going to uh, tell you about is something related to shear jamming. And this is work uh, that's been done uh, by Vinuta, who's, who's in the audience. And uh, so I'm going to tell you about a part of the work that's, that's soon coming out, uh, Monday. Uh, and and, and uh, that I, I talk about by way of introduction, uh, what I want to spend most of the time on is this stuff that we're currently trying to sort of get our heads around. Um, and and uh, there are many things that we're not at all uh, clear about at the moment, and, and uh, I would really appreciate anybody who has ideas on how to understand the results that I'm going to present uh, to, to tell us. Okay, so here is a, a quick introduction about jamming. Uh, historically, the work starts with the, uh, or, or the field in some sense, starts with the work of Bernal, who was trying to understand liquid structure uh, by, by looking at packing those spheres. And uh, that uh, turned out to be not exactly or not completely uh, a successful project, but what it initiated was uh, a whole field of understanding how spheres pack and, and, and uh, its consequence in a, in a variety of fields. And uh, <clears throat> so one of the observations uh, of Bernal and, and uh, his co-workers was that if you take a bunch of steel spheres or, or spheres made of any, any other thing, shake it up and let it settle down, uh, there was, under a large set of circumstances, uh, a packing fraction of about 64% into which these random sphere packings settled. And this is called the random close packing value. And uh, this has been sort of found in so many different ways that there's been uh, sort of a, a notion of a universality to this value. But uh, we sort of understand uh, currently that uh, this is not a really universal number. Uh, so some work with Pinaki uh, uh, I mentioned here in this context. And, uh, but on the other hand, a lot of what happens near this jamming point does seem uh, very universal, critical-like, and, and uh, interesting. And, and so uh, for the purposes of my talk, the 64% or, or the jamming that happens uh, at 64% is what happens uh, for a system that is isotropic and that is devoid of friction. Okay, and uh, so if I say jamming and don't put these adjectives, please understand that that's what I'm talking about. I'm going to be contrasting it with the case that we have been studying. Okay, now <coughs> uh, uh, a sort of a, a reference uh, to keep in mind, though it's not directly going to be relevant um, in, in, in detail, is the hard sphere phase diagram, and, and there's some sort of special densities uh, that, that come up. Uh, so the, the hard sphere system has a transition from a fluid state to a solid state, uh, uh, going from a packing fraction of 0.494 to 0.55 roughly. Uh, there's a glass transition that is expected around 0.58. And uh, then the random close packing density around 0.64, and of course, close packing at 0.74, okay? This is just a roadmap. Uh, I'm, we're going to revisit these numbers in different contexts. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> what we sort of stumbled upon as a problem and, and, and a set of questions to ask uh, relates to something called shear jamming, which is um, <clears throat> the idea that unlike what Bernal and co-workers did, which was to sort of compress things uh, till you couldn't compress anymore. If you were to take an assembly of spheres or suspensions um, and, and, and you apply shear deformation, okay? So you're not decreasing the volume. The volume may remain constant, but you're, you're deforming the system. Then under certain circumstances, you can get jamming uh, below this uh, isotropic jamming point of 64%. Okay, uh, so this is uh, illustrated here by some uh, cartoons uh, of, you know, that ref sort of try to sort of explain what is going on uh, in a paper by uh, 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 Max B. et al., Bulbul Chakraborty, etc. 
as many of us know, is one of the authors. Uh, so here is a, a picture which shows density on the x-axis and, and stress. And, and the idea is that if you didn't have friction, there, there is a, a density of 64%, uh, which is represented by Pj here, above which, in order to unjam, you have to apply finite stress. And uh, in, in contrast to this part of the picture, if you now have friction present as well in the system, there could be an extended range of densities below phi j where you could also have jamming as a result of uh, application of stress. So the idea is if I'm sitting at a density like this, let's say 60%, after applying a sufficient amount of stress, I would then find myself in a situation where the system jams, okay? And in this uh, picture, uh, <coughs> jamming is sort of intrinsically, if you will, associated with the presence of frictional interaction, okay? So the question that we have been sort of thinking about is can we think about shear jamming without thinking about friction principally, okay? And uh, more precisely, what we have been asking is what roles do shear deformation and friction play in generating shear jamming, okay? And, and the, the first part of the work, which I will summarize in this, summarize in this horribly busy uh, slide, which is sort of uh, uh, under publication, is, uh, has one sort of simple point, uh, which is that um, there, is, there are sort of precise ways in which you can disentangle the role that shear deformation has and uh, friction has in generating shear jamming. And uh, um, one sort of key feature in, in sort of looking at uh, this phenomenology is the fact that the system that you're looking at is athermal and under the application of external uh, uh, stress, it can organize um, in, in, in particular ways. So the system that we have been looking at is a monodispersed frictionless system of soft spheres, which are subject, subjected to what is called athermal quasi-static strain, which means that you basically let the system evolve under an external uh, deformation in, in such a manner that it's always in a local energy minimum. Okay, so this is, a, this is the athermal part, and the quasi-static is, is, you know, refers to the fact that you do this very slowly so that uh, inertia, and, and other sort of features like that do not play a role, or finite shear rates do not play a role in, in the behavior that you're looking at. Um, okay, <clears throat> and, and we look at what happens to the geometry and, and the mechanics of the system as we continue to apply this kind of shear deformation and one reaches a steady state. So the manner in which the steady state is uh, approached is, is illustrated here by the mean contact number and uh, this is shown for a, a variety of densities. And, and in all cases, one has an initial part where as a result of the shear, more and more particles come into contact. And that mean contact number eventually saturates into a steady state value. And uh, if one looks at this steady state value as a function of the density, one finds that above uh, a density of about 55% in packing fraction, uh, this me, uh, mean contact number goes above a magic number of four, which is D plus one in three dimensions. And it's a magic number because that's the uh, estimate or, 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 a, or a number that uh, Edwards proposed as the limit in the contact number above which frictional spheres can have jamming, okay? I will come back to this point. And there are a variety of ways in which the structure uh, can be seen to change, and in particular change in a manner that it becomes more and more like how people have in the past described jammed configurations for frictionless spheres, okay? So, uh, so we have a situation where by the application of, of deformation for frictionless systems, we develop the geometry that has been attributed to jammed configurations, but we see this at densities that are far, far below the jamming point, okay? So then uh, the question was, what does this mean? Because uh, at those densities, isotropic systems could not be jammed. And, and what we have shown is that these are 
structures that evolve which have the correct geometry, the correct uh, geometrical features uh, for frictional jamming to take place. In other words, uh, the shear deformation generates the geometry that is necessary for shear jamming to take place if friction were to be present. Okay, so this is our uh, sort of separation of, of causality uh, between geometry, sorry, shear deformation and, and friction. Okay, um, and 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 uh, this is an aside, uh, but it will come up briefly later on. Uh, what we find by sort of so we check this by taking our steady state uh, deformed configurations and we turn on friction and ask, does the system jam? Okay, and we find that indeed above 55 percent they do jam, and uh, uh, interestingly, by doing this using different protocols, we always find that even if the exact density at which shear jamming takes place uh, is protocol dependent and different, the mean coordination number or the mean number of contacts at the point in which shear jamming takes place is d plus one, okay? And this, okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the nature of the structures uh, in shear jamming, understandably, is very different from isotropic jamming. Oh my, all right. Uh, how did that happen? Okay, uh, <clears throat> is an isotropic. So here are some sort of questions that we have been looking at now, and I'll try to squeeze that into the remaining time. Um, one is, if I just gave you the geometry, if I didn't tell you where it came from, uh, are you going to be able to predict whether it can shear jam or not? And, and, and the way in which you can answer this question, let me just actually go, to, go through these, uh, is to <coughs> basically write down the force balance conditions and ask if the geometry that is implicit in this matrix M, the contact matrix, is sufficient to sort of generate solutions that are force balanced. And what we show is indeed that we not only can generate force balanced solutions, uh, we can compare it with what we obtain when we do have friction explicitly present and show that they, they, they are the same, okay? Uh, I'll skip the details um, and including, okay, so one particular detail is that um, above 55%, which is the threshold density, uh, we do have force distributions that have finite uh, force peaks, which has been seen as a characteristic of, of shear jamming. I'm of jamming, okay? Um, now, uh, this one I'll, I'll go through very quickly. Uh, one of the key geometric features that has been looked at of, uh, near jamming is something called hyperuniformity. The basic idea is if you look at long wavelengths for jammed systems, density fluctuations go to zero, okay? So the, the, uh, the structure factor scales linearly or, or some power of K and uh, uh, this recently has also been seen in periodically driven systems. I won't have uh, time to explain that. And what we see is that in our shear jam systems as well, uh, there are signatures of hyperuniformity. Okay, now, one thing that we don't have a very good handle on is if we want to have a percolation picture, which is something that's been talked about a lot in the context of jamming, what is the correct percolation to look at? Okay, and the reason this is not very obvious, is we can look at a variety of different percolation problems. We can look at uh, contact percolation. We can look at the percolation of particles that are defined as locally jammed, where they have D plus one contacts. Uh, or we can look at particles that have 2D contacts, which is a condition for, for uh, isotropic jamming of the conventional kind. And we find different percolation thresholds and only one of them corresponds to something that we can attribute meaning to by other ways. Okay. Um, and we can also look at percolation as a function of, 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 of strain. And uh, I will go to the, this slide, which is very interesting. So here is a summary of what we find, which has the strain on the y-axis and the packing fraction on the x-axis. And what you find is that, in fact, there are different thresholds. Um, and, and one particular threshold, namely uh, the percolation of six coordinated particles, corresponds to shear jamming, but there's no very good reason 
uh, by which we can understand why that should be the correct percolation problem. Okay, so this is something that we're struggling with. Uh, last, yeah, I, I'm, I'm done. Uh, we also uh, look at the mechanics of these systems and show that above uh, at least 57%, which is close enough to this lower density limit, uh, we have finite shear moduli. Okay, so let me just flash this up here. Uh, I'll stop. If there are any questions, you can spend the next six seconds. Thank you. Yes, one question. Do you see hyper uniformity for all values of, I mean, which regime? I mean, okay, this is not very clear. I didn't have time to sort of, uh, so we do see that above this 55%, but at the highest density we look at, it's clear enough. At lower density, it's not clear whether we are seeing hyper uniformity or not. We're working on this, but at least close enough, you know, at, at the 0.63, which is not really close to the isotropic jamming point, we see hyper uniformity. Structure factors. Structure factors. Yeah. We have time for one more question why we are changing computer. Yes. Show sure, pictures of the shear jam states, but in frictional jamming, you have these long force chains that come up. Do you see them in the shear jam states as well, without friction? Yeah, but I'll, I'll yeah. So we we do we do find anisotropic structures, um, but but the force networks do eventually become isotropic. How do you balance the tangential? Sorry, maybe we can talk. Yeah, we, I can. Okay, sorry for. Thank you.